you know who I am, I don't have to present myself, I have to present so I'm Nenon Mishevich from various towns and countries, it's Maribor and Rijeka and Budapest, uh, the whole Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the stuff that you know. And this is, for the main part, it's Plato's Republic, his book on the state that you probably encountered when you started getting interested in philosophy. So this is, I, I assume that you know, that you know the stuff. And I want to connect the things that we all know to a relatively recent interest in philosophy. And this is the interest in thought experiments. So, uh, <coughs> Uh, usually, people, when they think, they think about thought experiments, and if you're not sure what a thought experiment is, this explanation will come in a second, they say that this is armchair philosophy, so philosophy done in an armchair. And, you know, I was looking at pictures of armchairs on the web, and they all appeared too luxurious. Because the actual armchairs in which philosophy was done uh, was done in a very shabby armchairs. So uh, most of these people were sometime in exile or hiding or both. So the people that we will be mentioning would be people like Plato, like Locke who spent time in exile, uh, Hobbes who was in a bad relatively bad position, Spinoza. So this is, I think, the most luxurious stuff to be found, you know, for sitting. Uh, Rawls is a different story. Rawls was at Harvard, and I think they have better armchairs there. Uh, I, I haven't been to Harvard, but you have professors who've been to Harvard, and, and I will ask them about armchairs there. I need to learn about that a bit. So... I think that's it. Uh, now, uh, let's go slowly to the topic. So, in, we've got two thought experiments in, 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 in the Republic. And the first one is the Ring of Gyges. I, and I'll, I'll come back to, to, to the, the bigger thing after I remind you of the thought experiment. So the thought experiment is basically the following thing. You've got the armchair. You sit in the armchair. So this is basically this armchair th thought, armchair philosophy. The term comes from England, from Hume. And people like Hume. You know, was and when you, when you look at Hume, there's a portrait of Hume sitting in the armchair. He's roughly my size. You sort of get the idea Whereas in German tradition, of course, uh, we're talking about cabinet, sitting in the cabinet, because it was Prussia, you were supposed to sit like this, you know, very, no armchairs. You sit like this, and this is Kabinetten denken. But in Anglo-Saxon Anglo tradition, they call it armchair philosophy. Okay, so here's the first example of a thought experiment. It's very famous. Uh, and this is basically, the point is that people are more or less pigs. And they, are, they do good things and they do right things only out of fear. This is what this person, Glaucon, uh, wants to argue. And he argues for it by asking you to imagine a fictional, fictive situation. And then judge. So here's the text. But as for the, so those who practice justice do so unwillingly. So everybody who is doing just things is doing it unwillingly. Doesn't want to do it really. It does it from because he or she doesn't have power to commit injustice. In Jowett's beautiful translation, uh, does it from want of power to commit injustice, 
we shall be most likely to apprehend that, we understand this, if we make in the thought, and for those of you who like Greek and who are not afraid of Greek crisis, uh, here's the Greek word, uh, uh, in the thought, te, te dianoia, the E is written below the alpha and is not pronounced, uh, te dianoia, namely we have to imagine the following thing. We grant to each, the just and the unjust, license and power to do whatever he pleases, and then accompany them in imagination and see whither his desire will conduct each. So you get the piggy guy, the unjust, egoistic pig, and you've got the just guy, and say, gee, you know, give them the freedom to do what they want, and then let's see what they will do. And the idea is that there was a ring given, uh, found by somebody whose name was Gaigas. There was a ring that makes you invisible. Uh, sorry? Yeah. So you've got a ring that makes you invisible. You turn the ring and poof, you disappear. And here is what you do. Suppose now that there were two such magic rings. And so you get to the just person, you give a ring, and you give a ring to the unjust person. So what would happen? He says, well, nobody, no man can be imagined. I won't bother you with the Greek. He says doxeian, which is not exactly imagined. Uh, host Doc saying, no man can be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he will stand fast in justice. So the idea is you get this charming, nice, you know, uh, gentleman who is always talking about what's right, etc. Then you give him the ring. Turn the ring and he is invisible. And then Glaucon says, well, what would the guy do? Well, you know, first he would rape his neighbor. And Plato imagines that he would rape his male neighbor. neighbor. Uh, but we can vary this in imagination. Uh, then he would go to a good bank. Not, you know, these banks that are in crisis, but like to a really good bank, German solid bank. And would just rob it, take all the money. And so on. Uh, in the actual story of Gyges, what happens is uh, relatively funny. Gyges, who is a shepherd, a uh, cowboy, uh, he becomes invisible and somehow gets to the king. And then he seduces the queen. Now, I can't believe that he seduced the queen being invisible. <laughs> Maybe she was into invisible guys. I, I have no idea. So the story is not very logical. Uh, but, you know, everybody, after a while, you know, you, you, you've got this neighbor and the person is so beautiful. I will not say woman or man because Plato thinks it's a man. Uh, you know, it's a sexy, you know, walking in the short toga or whatever he's got, you know. And you are strong and invisible, come on. I mean, yeah. So uh, I, I was teaching this million times in classes, and uh, most of the students are, 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 are women in, in, in philosophy in my class. And they were not enthusiastic about this. So every now and then, a woman was saying, I, I, I would not rape anybody, come on. You know. And I'm not into money. And they said, OK, suppose you think. So it was your boyfriend ends in prison. And you think he is innocent. And you really love him. And you are invisible. What would you do? I would kill the guards, <laughs> is the usual answer. <laughs> so I think for everybody you can find something. Yeah. 
And then the conclusion, so this is, this is a typical thought experiment. This is a classical thought experiment. This is what's called thought experiment. You imagine a situation. You play a little bit in imagination. It, it, and these are usually short thought experiments, like this one. You play a bit in imagination. And then you, there is a question. So here is the question is, would anyone resist the temptation? And you, you know, it's fun because you can fantasize the temptations. Uh, it's not all thought experiments are that funny. Uh, and then there is a serious question. What does... So, okay, so then you say, well, nobody would resist the temptation. You just need the right temptation. For men, you know, it could be sex and money. For women, it could be to save your boyfriend or something else or save your child. Uh, uh, for, you know, ladies who have already children, you say, okay, your child committed a terrible crime and, you know, the child is in prison, of course I would kill everybody and get him out, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, nobody would resist the temptation. And now what's the result? What's the moral of the story? And here is, and here is the formulation. And we may truly affirm this to be a great, well, well, well. Tecmerion is not proof. Jovet is exaggerating. To be a good sign, a very good sign, is the, the Tecmerion is a sign. It's a really good sign that a man is just, not willingly, or because he thinks that justice is any good to him individually, but that people are just, they obey the laws and stuff, only out of necessity. It's basically out of fear. Uh, for whenever anyone thinks that he can safely be unjust, there he is unjust. I mean, I, can, you know, I come from Croatia. Uh, our former prime minister is sitting in jail. He is a colleague. He is an intellectual and... We all thought, you know, he's, he's a bit conservative and stuff, but we all thought, you know, he's, basically he's okay and he was quite impressive and stuff. He ended up in jail for stealing huge amounts of money. So, you know, looks like the reality is a bit helping the thought experiment, at least in my country. Uh, but it can happen to you guys as well. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's the, that's the reasoning. Uh, so why do I need this? I need this in order to show that Plato has actual thought experiments that are undoubtedly thought experiments, that are thought experiments for sure. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, now this is, you know, this is, uh, okay, yeah, I, I won't complicate. So Epicureans... As you know, Epicureans were Epicurean, so they thought, you know, ah, come on, you know, we shouldn't exaggerate with justice. So their, you know, their idea is, well, you know, the imagined scenario demands too much of a human being. You know, so come on, you know, if you really get invisible, you know, of course you would rape and steal, but this doesn't show that people are bad. Wow, you know, <laughs> that's a funny reasoning. Uh, but the, the one thing that I, I want you to notice is that the kinds of reactions, because you will have them again nowadays. You have them in contemporary philosophy. It's the same, you have the same reactions to thought experiments. There is this thing that's called experimental philosophy, and this is that you, you ask questions, you ask the same questions, and then you do a kind of psychological investigation. So, for example, I ask you these questions, and then, you know, we first do the statistics, you know, uh, here, men and women, whether there are different reactions. So, you know, I, I, was, I would suppose that men will be more ready to commit all this stuff, and that ladies will be more discreet about it. Then you, you ask, you know, whether there's a difference in age. Then, if you are lucky, you can also have students of different origin. So you, you can have here whatever, you can have, you know, Lithuanians, 
Poles, Russians, Jews, whatever. Then you see, you, then you look whether everybody has the same reaction. So it could turn out that uh, some ethnic, some nations, some ethnic groups, uh, or some religions are being more strict. A typical reaction at home, negative reaction that they get is the girl who says, I am religious and I can't imagine people doing these things. So uh, uh, I, get, I get much more sort of negative answers to the question from students who are religious. And psychologists now, it's a, it's a fashion, you do psychological investigation about this. And uh, then the usually, usually you, you get some variation and then you try to see from the variation you know, what's in people's heads. Uh, now Cicero, who was sort of attracted to Stoicism, but not really a Stoic, he defended it. He says the thought experiment brings out the truth from the ordinary person, like the torture does. You know, so so uh, uh, um, these were nice times, you know, when people thought that torture brings out truth. Uh, but it's a kind of interesting and nice nice uh, uh, analogy. And then uh, Glaucon uh, draws a very far-reaching conclusions out of the thought experiment and proposing, proposes something like a social contract. So people determine that it is for their profit to make a deal. Compact is an old word. To make a deal with one another, neither to commit nor to suffer injustice. Uh, so, and this is the beginning of legislation and contracts, covenants between men, and so on and so on. So he gets really from this uh, 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 thought experiment about the piggy, piggish nature of people, he gets an argument for a social contract theory. As usually, when I teach this to, to my students, I do a table showing why it is profitable to uh, agree that you will not commit injustice, no, you will suffer injustice, but we don't have time for that. Now comes, so this is, this is nothing original. Now comes my own story. Now comes my own interpretation of the Republic. I'm claiming that the most part, the biggest part of the Republic, so it's Republic uh, minus chapter 6 and minus last chapter, but everything else. So it's like about 230, 200 pages, depending on, on what edition you have, uh, that the whole republic is a thought experiment. So how do we get to this? Uh, we ask, Socrates asks, what is justice? No. What, is, what would be the just arrangement? Now, uh, for those of you who like philosophy of political philosophy, you probably have heard the claim that the central question of political philosophy is what would be the just arrangement? What would be justice? What would be just in a political, in a political uh, uh, community? Uh, usually it is asked in the terms of the state, what would be the just state. But since there are, for example, people who are anarchists, who don't believe in the state, they still believe in a just society. So we can, we can generalize the question, we don't have to mention state. We can just say the fundamental issue in political philosophy is what is justice. And then Plato, or Socrates in the book, is proposing a method. He says, how will you find out what is justice? Well, let's try to imagine. Let's try to imagine uh, a constitution. Let's try to imagine a community which we shall 
see as being just. And once we agree that this is the just thing, then we will know what is justice. Here's the text. If we could watch a thing, polis, it could be a state, it could be a city, if you are anarchist, it could be just a just community of people. Uh, so if we could imagine this kind of political community, the polis, coming to be, if we could watch it being born, how? In logo. So in the logos. In the logos could mean ten different things. But it's basically, it's either in the speech, or in the dialogue, or in our reason. You know that logos means everything. But basically it's not in reality. It's somewhere in our speech and in our head. If we could watch a city coming to be in logos, wouldn't we also see its justice coming to be? And its injustice as well. And then the poor guy always says, yeah, yeah, you're right, Socrates, ooh, super. And I said, and when that process is completed, we can hope to find what we are looking for. So, uh, Araun Endego, it's in the first person, it's Socrates speaking, so I said, Endego, I said, a gignomenen polin theasaimeta logoi. So, theasaimeta is I think it's subjunctive of treao, of I am observing. So uh, if, we, if we were to observe polin gignomenen, the political community coming to life, or becoming to, coming to exist, logo, in logos, it's again the yota under the omega, so it's not pronounced, it's logo. Wouldn't we, kaiten dikaiosunen autes idoimen, wouldn't we also see its justice, dikaiosunen? And the poor guy says, yeah, 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 tahaan, yeah, good, yeah, yeah, good. And then we can hope uh, to find idein ho zetumen, to see what the thing that we were looking for. Uh, and then they are building the ideal city. So, how do we do this? Well, we start from people around, you know, we say, okay, suppose, uh, you know, the university gets blocked and you can't get much out, you can get food from somewhere and now you can do the rules, you have to do the rules of, uh, you know, how you live together. I was in Graz, they have a strike, a blockade of the university, so they were sitting there and sleeping there, and you've got the Austrian way of doing revolution. So the left corridor, sorry, the left corridor, there you can bring dogs to sleep, because there were some students who don't like dogs, and those students sleep in the right corridor. And then it's very important, you know, when you finish eating, you either wash the plate, or if the plate is made of paper, then there is a special waste basket for the paper plates. And the, 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 the rules are like, you know, 70 rules. And I was saying, Jesus, you know, this is like my grandmother. This is, this is how we were living at home. And, you know, if you think this is revolution, you know, what is ordinary life like? <laughs> so this is the Germanic order in the revolutionary strike. Uh, basically, you've got this kind of thing, you have to live together, uh, and what you do, so here we go, one man calling another for one service and another for another, we being in need of many things, gather many into one place as associates and helpers, and to this dwelling together. Uh, uh, and the, the uh, expression is synoikia. It's really the, 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 the living together, the having the ecos together. Uh, we give the name city or state, right? And then between one man and another, there is an interchange of giving because 
have each supposed this to be better for himself. And then says, come then, let us create a city from the beginning. Ex aches. Uh, if you are Heideggerians, you know, your heart will start beating when you hear the word ache, ache. Whereas the you know, British just think this is, you know, beginning in time. So we do the tologo en aches. I, I, I can hear the hearts beating. Uh, uh, we create a city from the beginning in the Logos. And, uh, 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 and who, is, who is really the creator of the city? The creator of the city, as Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, and Kamer Lenin would say, are our needs. Hegemetera Hreya. Hreya could also be uses. So it's, it's a bit ambiguous. But the formulation is really light from the capital. Uh, and the poor guy answers, Pos de U. Oh, of course, my teacher, this is pure Bologna. Uh, and then you add, then you add more and more elements. So, for example, more things are produced and better and more easily when one man performs one task according to his nature at the right moment. So then we, we need more than four citizens. We start first with a very small group. So we need the farmer, and the farmer has to use a plow, and he needs a smith to make the plow, and so on and so on. So... Uh, Okay, so I can't, I just can't, I just can't uh, resist mentioning something that's not on the... Do you remember how you get a bigger community out of the small one in the Republic? What's the main step? No. Perfect. So... That's it. So suddenly Socrates says, gee, you know, we can't live without luxuries. Point one. Point two. So we have to do some, what? Uh, more? Uh-uh. Before that. Where do you get luxuries from? You need, impo you need import. So basically you can't live without, you know, Billa or Lidl. You know, you need a supermarket. In order to need a supermarket, you have to be able to sell something to the guys. That is where you, you come from, you come in. But if you need this, then you need a surplus because you have to sell it. For surplus, you need a lot of land. But then you have to defend the land. And for this, you need the army. Then you enter NATO. So that's the, that's the line. And you think, Jesus Christ, you know, why... Why that? You know, why is it really so that you can't have a just community without a supermarket? Yeah, it's, it's very funny. And, you know, suppose you are a pacifist. Suppose you are, you, are, you are a determined pacifist. You think, okay, you know, if you need an army in order to have a supermarket, then it's better not to have supermarket. If you need to go around killing people in order to have a nice supermarket, then why not give up on supermarket? This is what? This is the minimalist anarchism. This is John Zerzan. But <laughs> this is what you ask yourself. You know, why, why that? Why, why I'm telling you this? Because uh, it shows one important feature of thought experiments. And this is that when you do a thought experiment, you import various things from reality. So, uh, uh, Plato uh, is not explicit, but he will import from Greek reality the idea that women are for reproduction and men are for true love and really good sex. This is something that we would not, at least not in this form, import into a thought experiment. Uh, the same thing goes for thought experiments in science. 
Uh, if you do a, so, take a, take a, the simplest simplest thing. Uh, you've got a, you put a necklace around or chain around, and you ask, do you know, is the chain going to move? Uh -uh. Then the guy says, yeah, put a circular chain. If this starts moving, since this is symmetrical, it will never stop moving. Therefore, it's better to assume that it will not move. Uh, this is Simon Stevin. It's the beginnings of, of, physic, of modern, phys modern physics. So you import all sorts of assumptions about physical bodies into the thought experiment. For example, you thought you import the assumption that the moment you put the chain, the necklace will not start flying. As you know, in the cartoons, you don't have these assumptions. In the cartoon, when you close the necklace, the necklace could just start flying. Uh, you import in the thought experiment the idea that uh, infinite movement is impossible, that you can't buy a perpetuum mobile, you know, for the price of a necklace. Uh, what is it? Uh, 80. What is it called? Litas. Right. Uh, that I, I learned this morning. Uh, you can't get a perpetual mobile for that price. The same thing, you import various assumptions from ordinary life. For example, the assumption that you can't live without shopping into a thought experiment. It's quite shameful, but you have to do it. Okay. Then you move to the bigger picture. You've got the, the, the soldiers, the NATO the guardians, and you say, do you know, how are they to be educated? And this is, of course, this may be expected to throw light on the greater inquiry, which is our final end. How do justice and injustice grow up in states? So the, you remember the education of the guardians will be basically this dance of philosophy and a little bit of astronomy. Uh, I don't know whether you you remember why astronomy is needed. Uh, because people have to reproduce according to the sign in horoscope. So if you don't know a lot of astronomy and astrology, you can't tell the officer X to go and make baby to the lady Z. That's the main thing. But also, astronomy is good for making your soul more peaceful and harmonious. You watch the stars moving. And since they move very slowly, this relaxes you. And your soul becomes harmonious. You've probably read the Republic. Good. Uh, so this is the general picture. The general picture is, the Socrates asks you, imagine an arrangement A. I in concreto, for example, the community of goods. Is it just? And then the poor guy says, oh yes, Socrates. And this is a small thought experiment. This is just about one particular arrangement. Then we go to the next arrangement. For example, what about community of children? What if you have all children in common? Would that be just? And then the guy imagines this and says, oh, this is fantastic. You know, that would be super, etc., etc. And you repeat the procedure. Each micro-thought experiment is a step in the big thing, in the macro-thought experiment, which is the whole of the Republic. So you ask for each arrangement, is it just? And if the answer is yes, and if they fit together, the result is the perfectly just polis, in Greek, the kalipolis. Ah. Uh, there are interesting things here, that is the, the connection with dialogue and connection with myth, with narrative, with narrative, but we don't have time for that here. And now we go to the goals of thought experiments. Why do you write Republic? Uh, I will not tell you my 
sort of cynical remarks about why the Republic was written. We can do it in the discussion. Apparently, Plato was in love with the general. You get it. Oh, you get it from Plutarch. You should be reading Plutarch. Uh, so, Dion is the biography of Dion. There are, the explicit goal is cognitive, is epistemic. Find out what is justice. The method is to find or construct a system of arrangements, each of which appears just to your interlocutor. Let him conclude that the system itself is just and find what is the characteristic of the system. This is then the just. But as we know from Plato's biography, you have kind of an additional goal, which is once you fantasize your just polis, you go and try to realize it. So Plato was... Plato thought he can do it by educating the boss. You know, you get yourself, you go to the Syracuse. Uh, Syracuse was the best developed country at that time, militarily the most successful. So this is like getting to Washington. And then you walk into Pentagon and you fall in love with the main general. That's the story. And you've got the boss... And you try to persuade the boss to put the story in reality. And you know what happens, the boss throws you out. But uh, there is this motivational thing that, of course, to implement the system as far as possible. Yeah, okay. Uh, now we... Pass from that to something that you know well, I think, and this is the notion of a utopia. So if you buy, or God forbid, pirate the book by Malcolm Scofield on the Republic, Scofield will say that it is a work of political utopianism. The Republic is the first great work of political utopianism ever written. And what is utopian thinking? The, it's the imagining of a blueprint for a desired world which is nevertheless located in present-day concerns. And he says, utopianism will always be with us. This is like reading Ernst Bloch, Guys der Utopie, but in the Oxford version. So utopia is imagination of alternatives, and imagination of alternatives looks like political thought experiment. Uh, utopian thinking... Could, sorry, utopian thinking could be regarded as a particularly ambitious and comprehensive exercise in the imagination of alternatives. So you see that Scofield is very close to saying this is a thought experiment. And there are some people who said that, but the funny thing is that the clearest formulation was, is in a book that is, in, that is like a popular philosophy for high school kids. The, there the guy says, Gardiner says, this is a thought experiment. And nowhere else you have a, a, a kind of systematic explanation. Then uh, one guy whose name is Smith, uh, he, he did something on the topic. And then when, he, when we met, he said, wow, you know, we really agree. This is a political thought experiment. You know, but you go on and publish the stuff. I'll be doing myself late, my thing later. So my paper is coming out now in, in Routledge. Uh, uh, so this will be, I think, I, hopefully, this will be the first analysis of the Republic as a thought experiment. Okay. Uh, so let us look now at utopias. You know, utopias, you, there's Thomas More, uh, who wrote the book that's called Utopia. And there are all these political utopias around the same time. There was Tommaso, Camp Tommaso Campanella, etc. We had one guy who was uh, Italian, say he was Italian, Croat, say he was Croatian. His name in Croatian is Franjo Petric, is Franciscus Patricius in Italian. He was born in Croatia. He did a thing that was also kind of ideal, ideal city, saying everybody was writing utopias in the Renaissance. And then you got m more and more. And uh, what's, the, what's the difference between this philosophical, political thought experiment and the utopia? I think that it's really is the motivational. 
uh, utopia is not primarily answering the theoretical question, you know, what would a just police look like? Utopia is supposed to push you, to move, to move you, you know, the kill the king and let's do the republic. This would be the Harrington. This would be the, the English republican utopianism. Uh, or, you know, you've got all sorts of utopias. Then you've got 18th century utopias. You've got the Saint-Simon, Fourier, etc., etc. And it's always, and it's always uh, 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 what distinguishes utopia from simple from political thought experiment of platonic kind is is uh, that it's more motivational. Okay? But the same text you can sometimes read as more epistemic and sometimes you can read it in as more motivational. Uh, of course, the motivational stuff is more dangerous. Uh, my generation, you know, we... When I started reading Marxism, uh, the... The, the Engels, uh, the, the stuff, you know, communism from utopia to science, that was what you had to read uh, in the school, if you were in a very good school. Then at the university, that was reversed. They said, oh, you know, we've got these fantastic utopias in Marxism. And there was this guy, Ernst Bloch, and I, I was, he was like the god of utopian, neo-utopian Marxism, and... When I was 17 and a half, I went to a conference on an island because it was on an island and uh, uh, the idea was that we're going to have a good time. And there was Ernst Bloch. There was also Marcuse. But there was Ernst Bloch, so I managed to meet the greatest Marxist utopian writer before he died. And uh, there was all sorts of funny things happening, but I can't tell you now about that. And then, you know, then you get uh, pro-utopia, anti-utopia, and nowadays you've got this guy who just died, uh, Cohen, who wrote a small utopian thought experiment, Why Not Socialism? So this would be, I think, the right way of presenting the stuff. Uh, and God knows how much this will mean for you in a few years. Okay, now I'm switching the gear and saying that in the modern age, you have another huge thought experiment, and this is social contract. Social contract is very different from Platonic Utopia. Basically, the difference is the following. In Platonic Utopia, we are intellectuals, aristocrats, who are very educated, and we are trying to make a blueprint about how people should live. So we are wondering, you know, how the cleaning lady should live. Yeah. And we, as intellectuals, we decide about her life. Yeah. Well, you know, she'll be cleaning. That's good. Uh, she should not, you know, be too much in touch with the poisonous substances because she would die, then she couldn't be able to clean. <laughs> what about her sex life? Well, gee, that's a bit of a problem because the point of the sex life is creating children. Now, cleaning ladies, they're not the type that you would really want to have children in a perfect polis, you know. So, you know, we should put restrictions on multiplying the progeny of cleaning ladies. Now, what about a particularly intelligent and aggressive cleaning lady who says, okay, this is all bullshit, you know, you've, I've read the Constitution, you know, I have a right, you know, to my portion of sex monthly, you know. <laughs> well... Plato said we should bullshit her. We should tell her lies. This is called the royal lie. You tell her, you know, you've been made. 
out of very bad material, you know, of, out of chewing gum, anything, you know. We came out of gold. We are made of gold or something, you know. What is it now? It's not lithium. It's these this precious metals that you put in the, in the, mobitel, in the mobile phone uh, that you dig in Sudan. We are made out of that. Yeah. And you are made out of chewing gum. So, you know, it's only just that you don't have children. Since the condoms are so unreliable, you know, you better not, etc. Uh, this is something that you don't have in the social contract. The social contract is a thought experiment where you imagine the arrangement that every member would accept knowing about it. So it's no bullshitting. It's a full information. We say, okay, here we are at university is our police. We need full professor. We need a cleaning lady. You know, what's the arrangement that everybody would accept? It's a very, very different type of thought experiment. And, and our notion, I think, of human rights, our notion of freedom and equality has been given its philosophical form in the social contract thought experiment. Because it's, the, it's this voluntary, consensual thing. What would you sign? Now, uh, Spinoza believes partly, but he says, uh, in multiplis, in multis mere theoretica maneat. So the whole thing is a bit theoretical. But he's not saying it's a thought experiment. Uh, Rousseau says, this is a solution of the major intellectual task. And I suppose you all know this text by Rousseau. The task is to find a form of association by means of which each, joining together with all, may nevertheless obey only himself. So how do we, you know, how do we come together so that, you know, we all, what is the formulation? We are all joined together, but in every act, I'm really obeying all, only myself. How do we do it? We do it by signing a contract. I voluntarily join, I voluntarily accept that the general will will be binding for my will, and the general will is such that it takes into account the will of each particular person. Uh, this sounds like Monty Python, it sounds completely unrealizable, but it is still a political ideal. Now, this you might know, this is something that's, that's being widely, widely taught, and Soros was even giving money for teaching this. Uh, what is less known is Rousseau's introduction. If you remember, a social contract begins with this, you know, each, each of us is born free. Each man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. It's like really, you know. Uh, that was a rhetorical thing. The original first chapter of uh, social contract was a methodological introduction. And then Rousseau thought this would be boring for the normal reader and just threw it out. Uh, so if you look at the, at the posthumous works, you, you know that most philosophers have much bigger posthumous works than the works they wrote while they were alive. Uh, Kant, after he died, he was twice as productive as, as during his life. And you can't say, you know, that this is because, you know, wife and children were not letting him write because he didn't have wife and children. So we need another, we need a different explanation <laughs> why he was so productive after dying. And Rousseau, after dying in this posthumous first chapter of Social Contract, he says, Je m'intéresse pas au fait. Je m'intéresse au droit et la raison. So I'm not interested in the facts, meaning historical facts. I'm interested in what is right. Or, uh, yeah. It's like German Recht. It's ambiguous between right and law, but I think he means right. I'm interested in what is right, and I'm interested in the reason. So it seems that Rousseau was aware that this is actually all happening in thought. And then you get the main guy, of course, which is Kant. 
Properly speaking, the original contract is only the idea of this act. So here you get the first explicit recognition that it is a thought experiment. It is something that we imagine. We say, this is just, and we are going to arrange our life. We are going to arrange our laws so that they will resemble a contract, a free, con a free contract among us all. And this alone will legitimize the state. Now, uh, a student of mine who was at that time into anarchism and then stopped being into anarchism, and we know her both, Anna, she said, you know, gee, you know, what if we don't want a state? Of course, the answer is, no matter what kind of community you live in, you need a, legit a le legitimation for the collective decisions. So it's not just state. It's any kind of, of, a, of, a, of a society, any kind of political arrangement. And if we want political arrangements to be legitimate, we should bring it under the form of a free contract of free and equal individuals. Uh, and here I have a nice quote from Jeremy Waldron, which I will skip. Uh, so here I'm summarizing the cleaning lady argument. So Republic is from the third person. We, the intellectuals, are deciding about the cleaning lady. Uh, social contract is a first person thing. Uh, we ask for each and everybody asks for oneself, would I sign this arrangement or not? So everybody is equal in joining the contract. Okay, so I've got stages, how you do it. First ask the question, the guy has to understand the question and we can talk a lot about understanding. Then the guy tries to, person tries to imagine the thing. Uh, and then maybe some unconscious stuff is coming in. At the end, at stage five, you got explicit intuition. For example, oh yes, this is just. Or in the case of social contract, oh yes, I would sign this and this. And then you generalize. You say, yeah, what about other people? What about this and that? And finally you kind of try to balance all these intuitions that you had. And this balanced state has a snobbish title. It's called reflective equilibrium. Equilibrium because it's balanced and reflective because it's done by this. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so let me go to the beginning because I didn't want to to frighten you uh, by putting too many names. I'm sorry for this. The most famous social contact version of social contact thought experiment in contemporary philosophy comes from John Rawls. Rawls was a professor in Harvard. He started from a position that was quite leftist and then moved to a more centrist view uh, but the main work is theory of justice, and theory of justice is a kind of left, leftist social democrat type stuff. Uh, but what he's famous for is uh, this idea of veil of ignorance. And it's, he's, he himself describes it as thought experiment for the public for the purpose of public and self-clarification, so to, in order to explain, to clarify things to the public and also to oneself. The idea is that we consider various arrangements. So suppose, uh, suppose, uh, suppose, suppose you are a student. No. Suppose you are a gentleman. You are male. And you think, gee, you know, wouldn't it be nice you know, if men had advantages over women? So wasn't it very nice in old times you know, when women couldn't study? 
So, you know, in times of Virginia Woolf and, and G. Moore, uh, the scenario was the following. Men go to the university and uh, they hear these fantastic lectures by super professors. And then they go home and there are all these charmed girls who listen to their stories from the lectures. This is actually Virginia and Vanessa Woolf, two genius <laughs> persons from which you've seen, they couldn't go to listen to G.E. Moore because they were women and the lectures were only for men. So, if you are a gentleman, you know, wow, this is fantastic. You go to a talk, you know, there are all these ladies who like philosophy, so you come to them and say, yeah, if you're nice to me, I'll tell you, I will tell you the lecture. So some smart girls say, oh, no, I, I, I do everything in order for you not to talk to me about the lecture. But some will get hooked and say, wow, you know, tell me. And that's it. You win. Uh, this, was the, this is how, how Virginia got, 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 uh, uh, got frustrated. Uh, and then he all says, yeah, as a gentleman, of course, you, know, you might wish such a derangement. But imagine that you didn't know whether you will be in the final arrangement, whether you will be a man or a woman. You know, what if you don't know your gender? Wow. <laughs> well, you know, maybe you know, the best solution is equality. Because then, you know, if I am a man, okay, I don't get extra privileges. But if I am a woman, I don't get extra minuses. And we do this for every uh, problematic thing that we want to think about. For example, in my country, uh, you say, gee, you know, what, how should we treat the gypsies? Yeah, well, we should get rid of them, yeah, of course. I say, yeah, but what if you were a gypsy? How would you feel? I say, wow, you know, that's the... Uh. Uh. Okay, so you say, yeah, we should be nice to gypsies, we should give money to, to the gypsy community and stuff, and you know, if you give money to the gypsy community, uh, it will be the male leaders of the community who will take all the money. And that's just how it works. So say yourself, do you know, what would you do if you were a gypsy woman? And I say, wow, that's a bad luck. You know. <laughs> well, what would you, would you want to have in this thing, case? I would want to have a protection of the state. I would actually want the state to pay for my education. Well, so when we come to the laws, you know, maybe I will realize that you know, the best thing to have is oblig obligatory education for gypsy girls paid by the state. This is, I'm telling this from personal, personal experience in Croatia and in, in, in Budapest. I was, uh, I was in charge of... Uh, National Minorities Council in my town, and we basically worked with gypsy women. That was the, that was the work. And then we tried to organize something in, in Budapest. So that's, that's, how Rawls would, you know, that's how Rawls would describe the thing. You, you imagine yourself in various situations, and then you decide, not knowing which one you will be. This is called the veil of this is called the veil of ignorance. Now, here is something that I've been thinking about on the plane. And it, it bothers me a bit. But it might, it might interest you. And this is that we've got, we've got three sorts of thought experimental rules. One thing is roles. It's veil. So that's Rawls. So you could be anything, and you decide by not knowing out of this everything which one you will be. The rule that Rawls proposes is try to avoid the worst situations. So when you, when you build the picture of just society, try to do it so that even if you are born with some problems, suppose you're very ill, or if you are a member of a minority that as a whole was not too successful, etc., 
the arrangement should be such that it will avoid the worst. This is called maximizing the minimum. Uh, uh, my wife lives like that. She's this two-born pessimist. Uh, she always looks at the worst possibility and says, gee, you know, if this happens, we should do something against it. And, you know, I was, when I first read Rawls, I thought, you know, nobody's thinking like that. That's too pessimistic. Uh, now I've had 30 years of training, and I see that, that maximin could be a good strategy. Uh, many people are, just, are, are much more prone to the risk. They will say, okay, I'll, you know, I'll grab the big thing, even if you know, I should suffer if I don't get it. But Rawls is like my wife. He, he says, you know, imagine in all this imagined situation, you know, take the arrangement that would hurt you least, even if you are in objectively bad situation. So that's Veil. You've got the other thing, and this is Kant, our old friend, who says he doesn't have this not knowing, not knowing uh, which one you will be. So whether I will be identical with you or with him, or, or, or uh, I'll be the boss and be identical with Jonas. Uh, Kant has the other thing. Kant has, when you are thinking of a rule for yourself, imagine that this rule were followed by everybody. If that produces terrible shit, then drop it. So this is categorical imperative. So categorical imperative, veil is I'm, I don't know who I am and I'm choosing. The uh, categorical imperative is uh, I want a certain rule for my action. Imagine everybody following it. If the result is very, very bad, then I shouldn't do it. And the third is, what would be the third? The third is the old, very, very old proposal. Anybody has a, what would be the most traditional proposal of the same kind? Very close, very close, there's 10 are too many. There's, there's one, one thing that's kind of usually summarizing this old, the golden rule. Uh, tell them, please. But I think everybody knows. Yeah, yeah, but it <laughs> doesn't hurt to hear it. Treat others as, as you would like to be treated. Right, so golden rule has two forms, negative and positive. Don't do to others what you don't want to be done to yourself and treat others, do to the others what you would like to be done to yourself. So the idea is you put yourself in the shoes of the other. You know, so, so uh, 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 you know, I'm walking with a pretty young student, and we are talking, and she's being very sweet, you know, and I think, gee, you know, it would be nice to embrace her. And I think, gee, you know, imagine if there were an 80-year-old lady who's your boss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you discuss, you know, the, the program, you know, and she grabs you and kisses you. How will you feel? Say, so, yeah, I see, I get, get, the, get, the, get the message. Uh, so this is the golden rule thought experiment. I, 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 I try to imagine myself in the position of, of the young, pretty student. So this is golden rule, and here you've got a series of, of authors like Christ, Confucius, uh, Old Testament, you know, everybody, everybody was, was claiming this. And by the way, uh, since it's a very, very much comes from religious tradition, uh, you might be shocked that uh, Pyotr Kropotkin is taking it as the basic anarchist moral rule in the work Anarchism and Morality. Uh, says what we need in an anarchist society is a golden rule. Uh, for those who are curious on more sophisticated stuff, Derek Parfit has a fantastic comparative discussion of these. So this is Parfit on what matters.
Okay. So uh, now you see, you know, how huge this area of thought experiments in political ethics is. But there is, how do you say, huger, more huge <laughs> stuff. Uh, now comes the megalomaniac and crazy part of the lecture. Which is that half, the other half of political philosophy are really people who are criticizing thought experiments. So you've got this guy, you've probably heard of him, Aristotle, uh, who wrote this thing called politics. And in politics, he is, as Freud would put it, he's trying to kill the dead. He's you know, attacking Plato and the Republic. And he says it is proper, no doubt, to assume ideal conditions. This is not exact translation. So the Greek text is Dei un hypotit hestai kata euhen. Euhen is a kind of goodwill, good wish. So we can sort of make hypotheses according to what we wish, but not to go beyond all bounds of possibility, namely meden adunaton don't postulate what is impossible. Now, of course, you've, you've got this question, you know, it's an immediate question to play to Aristotle. You say, do you know, you are a genius, you invented logic, you invented four causes, you invented matter and form, but you couldn't imagine a society without slaves. Yeah. For you... The society without slaves is adunaton, is impossible. You know, how, how can you, and look, you know, somebody has to carry me home. Who's going to carry me home if I don't have a slave? Come on. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to serve my dinner by myself. I need a slave. Ah, if I'm Greek, I need a good-looking uh, boy who will be serving me the blini or whatever. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to do that myself, you know. This is not on the level of a university professor. Come on. Uh, so this is a bad question for, for Aristotle. You know, how do you know what, what are the close possibilities? You know, maybe you are just being... And then Aristotle says, do you know that, look, I've got my students, that was the Bologna thing, the, they were doing project together with the teacher. They collected 130 Greek constitutions. You bring this to Angela Merkel. They collected 130 Greek constitutions, and, and notice, they were not on the web. You had to go to particular policies, poli Police, the, the cities. I write down the thing. I collected 130 or something like that, 128 constitutions. Nowhere is there the case that there are no slaves. So obviously, it's logically impossible that you can have a police without slaves. That's obvious. But even you know, if you, you look at you know this, this, this primitive, you know. The, the, the Berlusconi Romans, even they have slaves. It's not only us, it's not only Greece. You know. Everybody has slaves. So, you know, it's impossible not to have slaves. This is the, this is the problem of this kind of realism that, that, that you get at the, with, the, with the opponents of thought experiments. Uh, and you've got parallels in physics. And you've got at Galileo's thought experiment. It's a, it's a very interesting parallel, but we can't go into this now. Uh, 
you know, here is, and then I think, okay, here, here is an element to, 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 to discuss with Plato, you know, which is this, you know, can you really make a state out of the need for supermarkets? This we, we, so, and so on. Uh, I have here a, a, a big, big thing of, but here's the, here are some critics. So you've got Aristotle, uh, you've got Hume and Burke criticizing social contract. You know, Burke saying this goes against tradition. Tradition is deciding what is just, what is unjust, what arrangements we should have, etc. Then you've got criticism from Hegel, that this is too abstract, and you've got criticism from Marx, that this is the bourgeois individualism, etc. And nowadays you've got, on the more feminist side, you got uh, intellectuals like Carol Petman. Carol Petman says the following. He says, you know, I'm a woman, and, you know, Rawls wants me to imagine how would I decide if I were a man. But this means abstracting from my body. I don't give away my body. My body is my body. I'm not going to abstract from it. No. Yeah, you're, you're, you're yeah, it's males who ask me to abstract from my body. That's, that's terrible. Because if I abstract from my body, I am nobody. That looks like a pretty logical conclusion. Uh, then you try to say this, Carol, look, it's, he's not asking you, I, you, know, you, you might love your body. Other people might share your view or not share and stuff. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is that the guy should imagine that he's a woman. You should imagine that you are a gentleman. You, you do, we, do, we do it both ways. Uh, because in that way, we will get an arrangement that's more fair. And then Petman says, no, this is completely unfair that to be required to abstract from your own body. And then she got a, a guy, Mills, who is doing the same thing for race. They published the book together. He's black, and he doesn't want to abstract from his color. Uh, you know, if if I'm black, this is my color. You know, it's like, you know, you ask this thing to abstract from... Uh, well, anyway, so uh, I'm not going to abstract from my color. I say, yeah, good, okay. You know, when I go to the beach and I get very sunburned, I hate the idea that I will be completely white in four months. You know. But it happens. Well, you know, these are the, these are the problems. Uh, you've got communitarians... You know, if you're a Latvian, of course you can't imagine being Russian. This is counter to nature. And vice versa. It's the community that is essential for you. So you've got this tradition of thought experiments. Two, I, I see it, there are two dominant uh, paradigms. One is Plato's Republic, and this is basically Greece and Greece and Rome and Renaissance in various forms. And then in the, in the modern thing, you've got social contract. And then you've got the critics. Now, let me conclude with some, something that's more fun. And these are the dystopias. So you've got all these negative utopias. Uh, Orwell, Zamyatin, me, uh, very nice dystopia. And so on, Huxley. And you think, gee, you know, what is, what is a negative utopia? Well, a negative utopia is a utopia where everything is bad. Instead of everything being good, like in classically positive utopia, in the negative utopia, everything is bad. But then when you start reading the thing, it turns out that all these authors, they are actually criticizing something like a platonic utopia, and they are criticizing it because people are not free in these utopias and they don't have choice because they don't have information. 
So if you look at dystopias at, from this point of view, they look like the revenge of social contract on the platonic utopia. These are really ideals that you get from the social contract tradition. And then you tell the Platonist, the Marxist, the Saint-Simonist, etc. You say, look, you haven't thought of that. You haven't thought, you, you know, your, your, uh, uh, in Zamyatin, uh, uh, you don't have names. You just got numbers. This is the beginning of the, of the thing. You are just a number. You never asked people, do you just want to be numbers? There are people who would have probably been happy to be numbers. Gödel was happy <laughs> to be able to turn every proposition into a number. Maybe he would have accepted, you know, <laughs> further generalization <laughs> of the method. But not everybody would. Uh, and I think the I think the 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 the, the, the typical dystopias are actually the social contract attacks on platonic kind of utopia. Let me end with a literary work. It's Ursula, Ursula Le Guin, uh, The Dispossessed. It has the subtitle, The Ambiguous Utopia. And the ambiguous utopia is really something that is half positive utopia, half negative utopia, and the reader is to decide. It's a, it's a, I, I, I just gave a long paper on that. It was uh, uh, in literature. You always a nice thing in literature is ambiguity. And what Ursula Le Guin did was she explicitly did a literary utopia that preserves this nice thing from literature, and this is ambiguity. So it reads very differently from all other utopias. So here is the megalomaniac idea. The megalomaniac idea is that perhaps we could look at the history of political philosophy from the point, from the methodological point of view, as the history of two traditions. One tradition is the tradition of thought experiments. The other tradition is the tradition of the enemies of thought experiments. And for every thought experimenter, you have an anti-guy. Every, every, and you can go through the whole history of European political philosophy. And maybe even you can go to Confucius and, and this other, Mencius above all, the interesting guys from the East. You can look at all this stuff in terms of these two big things. And then this stuff spills over into literature and culture, and you've got positive utopias, negative utopias, and recently you've got ambiguous utopia. So that's the story. Thanks. Ah, I get water. Questions, comments, Okay, so thanks. That's a, that's a super nice question. Uh, uh, so I think it's this first purpose, of course, is heuristic. It's to help us discover. And the question is, why is it so good as a heuristic device? And I think one line of answer for political thought experiments is to look at the theory of the narrative. We are much better in understanding stories than generally. People are better in understanding stories than in understanding abstract theories. Uh, a story is our usual way of getting causal connections. So, you know, you ask you know, why, you ask your friend, you know, why did you drop your whatever boyfriend? And then she says, or he says, whatever, uh, should be politically correct. 
so the person says, well, you know, uh, when I first met him, he seems to be such a generous guy. You know, but then, you know, after three months, I realized that he was a terrible egoist. Then I realized that, you know, he is actually looking at other relevant items of the kind, other men or other women. Uh, then it turned out it's not just looking. So what you get is you get a causal history, but the causal link is normally better understand if you put it in the narrative form. So narrative is a key to understanding, to ordinary understanding of causal interactions, especially on this human level, not frogs and stuff, but humans. And thought experiment gives us usually a narrative. It, it makes us, it, it makes easier for us to sort of understand what is causing what, what is the condition for what. Uh, this would be my guess about heuristic power of political thought experiments. Uh, now, the question about justification, I think, is, 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 is super good. it's a super good question, is how much does it justify? Well, I think, and this is not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm cheating a bit, but this is what we all do. Uh, I think it gives a prima facie justification. So justification to some degree. Uh, and then we have, then we have various ways of testing this justification. So, uh, for example, uh, there is this guy whose name is Gerald Gauss, who is very critical of thought experiments. He accepts part of it, but he's very critical of it. And then his line is, okay, imagine an arrangement between people and then, you know, after you've done the thought experiment, ask yourself or call a colleague who is doing game theory, you know, and say, well, you know, what would game theory say? Is this a stable arrangement? So suppose, uh, suppose you've got this community of children <laughs> and it looks good, especially if you don't like children, you think, you know, thanks God, somebody else will take care of them. Uh, it looks good if you are very collectivist because the community of children, you know, it gives children this feeling of collective, etc. And then you ask the game theoretician, he say, well, you know, given ordinary preferences of, you know, ordinary men and women, uh, would that kind of solution be stable? If you write it as a as a as a in a, in a table, you know in in Excel, you know would people sort of agree? Would they converge on this sort of thing? And the answer might be no, people wouldn't. Now, uh, my answer to Gauss was, and he got shocked when I told him that. I said, "But come on, a game theory is also mostly an a priori discipline." You are not out of the, of the a priori. You are just replacing the narrative stuff with mathematics. So you, you get some, some, you get some uh, information about people's preferences and wishes, but then for the rest, it's really it's mathematics is doing the thing. So uh, my proposal was then, I said, look, uh, uh, why don't you treat the game theory as the continuation of the thought experiment? And, and, and he, was, he was completely shocked. He said, I never, I never thought of, of, of that. I never thought of that in this way. So, so uh, you know, it's a, there, is a, there is a huge, uh, there is a huge uh, space for, uh, so this is the, uh, this is the basic, the basic structure. So you've got the thinker in the armchair thinking about how people would react. But these people are, are themselves idealized. Uh, Gauss says you, can, you, know, you should imagine that they are mostly altruistic, that they don't have terrible primitive uh, uh, ends, etc., etc. So what you get is 
this sort of thing. And now each of these guys is deliberating for oneself. So they are doing further deliberations. And I said, look, Gerald, I mean, this is just iterative thought experiment. So this is, this is me. I am imagining these people. And then these people are imagining various arrangements. So we are still in the thought experiment. And Gauss says, oh, no. So that was, that was happening two weeks ago. So this is, yeah, this is completely, completely new stuff. Uh, Uh, okay, so that's it, yeah, that's the, that's the whole thing. Uh, but I think I think I have a, I have a, 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 another slide a sl a version with uh, with game theory uh, inserted inserted into this. Uh, now, okay, so suppose, suppose you swallow that kind of theory. And then you say, yeah, okay, where, where does the empirical refutation come into picture? Uh, well, the two things. One thing is whether something is just. The other thing is whether something is doable, whether it, it could be done. And on, on the second question... Uh, the empirical refutation is possible. You know, it's just, you talk to the anarchist students and you say, gee, you know, it's a very noble idea that you lived without authority, but you won't survive for two days. Uh, uh, you need, you do a small blockade of the university strike, and the first thing you need is somebody who will be in charge of the order. And then the first thing you write is, uh, every student should obey the person who is in charge of the order. And then you say, do you know, why don't you want to abolish police? If it's exactly the same sort of thing. So some, some things just end up as not being implementable. They can be nice, they can be okay. But the other thing, of course, is uh, what happens if many people say that the arrangement is unjust? You know, what Would this be a falsification? That's a normative level. And, and this is where I think that the dangers for the thought experimental tradition comes in. So that's the long answer. What do you mean by borderline problems, uh, for example? When, um, let's say, you, you're just uh, interested in something, and, uh, but you uh, make yourself think about not uh, what you want, but what could be most terrible, most unimaginable thing. Uh, what uh, borderline in, in the sense of ima imaginable? good idea. So I will tell you, I will tell you why I'm thanking you. It's, it's sincere. It's not just a compliment. So in the last two years, I think, or three years, uh, a book appeared that was criticized Rawls. And this is the book by Amartya Sen on justice. I haven't read the whole thing. And Sen's basic idea is the following. Rawls and Rawlsians, they made a mistake because they are trying to imagine a good society. What we should do, that's too far away, that's too distant. What we should do is we should figure out what, what are the worst features of the real world. So uh, in an interview, he gives this, I like very much the example, and you will appreciate it, I think, in, in, in Vilnius. He gives an example of a sauna. 
So suppose you're sitting in a sauna and you have all, you know, a small group, you have all sorts of complaints. You know, why is this person, you know, spreading himself? You know, why is yeah, why the other guy is thinking and so on and so on. And then temperature goes up to 100 degrees. Now, this is total panic. You know, it has, it's way beyond, you know, narrow space and thinking and this kind of stuff. And this is, you know, this is where you call for help. This is the most urgent thing. So he says he has this, this, uh, this sauna uh, model for theory of justice. Don't look at, you know, how, what it would be like in the ideal sauna. Look at the most dangerous thing that's happening in the present sauna and try to stop it. And this is, you know, this is against Rawls, but it's also a bit against this thought experiment type thing where you, under the veil of ignorance, imagine how would you react. Now, I could steal your idea and say, G. Amartya, Sen, there is a thought experimental version of your story. And this is imagine the worst thing possible. And then you will know what you, where you have to intervene first. So that's, the, that's why I'm thankful, I think. I'll, I think I'll grab the idea. They have to write down your name to thank you. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, and I, of course, I feel bad that I didn't <laughs> come to the idea. <laughs> I was thinking about this sense stuff, and, and nobody said, you know, but this can be also done in a thought experiment. Obviously, it can. And, this is, and it's, it's, I, I, I find it a really good idea. And really, really good idea. Wow. OK, thanks. But anyway, how can you adapt uh, a maximum minimum strategy when you are ignorant? I mean, uh, I have troubles with uh, Rawls' uh, thought experiment. I'm not sure what he's trying to do. Whether he's trying to like suggest some sort of universal uh, justice theory or just tries to suggest something from his point of view. Because I agree, if the thought. I think the, behind the wheel of ignorance, there is, uh, there is no such thing as, as ignorance. There is Rawls and his theory of justice. And that's all there is behind that wheel. Why? Really Why? Uh, because, well, uh, because when he said, uh, well, because it's unimaginable to not know anything. Uh, well, Rawls. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay, you're right. But I would, I would say. Uh, I would say, you know, when you say anything, that's, you know, that's a kind of final thing. But what we do really when we solve ethical, we solve problems of justice, we imagine the particular thing. You know, so, uh, 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 so, uh, uh, you know, where every, everybody is, you know, everybody is, a bit into, you know, when you sit in a cafe, uh, even if you're at university, you know, and you sit with a beloved person or person that attracts you a lot, you know, together, you know, you want to be able to you know, sort of show the tenderness and, you know, you can do it at various levels and so on. And you are not expected, you know, people to shout at you because you kissed somebody in the, in the cafeteria. And then you say, gee, but what if you were homosexual? You know, would, you, you know, would you accept the same rules? So you are a man, you're still a man, still a gentleman, but you really love this guy, you know, and he loves you, and you're sitting together, and you feel like kissing him, and you can't do it. You know. uh, this is really this is like, a, like the putting oneself in, in other person's shoes. I say, if you didn't know what would be your preferences for the opposite sex or for your own sex, you know, would you equ equalize the treatment or not? And then if you are the, the maximum guy, you will say, gee, you know, what if I turn out homosexual? Well, 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 it would be smart, you know, to have the rule that I'm allowed to kiss my you know, boy darling, you know, darling boy. So this is the, I think if you go case by case, 
uh, you get relatively nice, relatively nice decisions. this will work let's see I mean well, well we, we, we you talked a bit about empirical yeah, well let's say I'm some radical I'm really not against gay or something but yeah. let's say I'm radical and I see oh my god this is nonsense man has to be strong love women and like go to war when it's needed um, and if it really is <laughs> happening so that such, uh, yep. such state mm -hmm. uh, just is not stable and then we go back to that uh, mm -hmm. then you have to look at immediate measures yeah wh which is worse mm -hmm. and we can can't adopt uh, Rawls universal universalist ac account or something like that and then it's again it's Rawls justice uh, in his circumstances and in his time of living and in his context, whose justice, which rationality? Hmm. 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 So what? What do you? S well, my my. I've got something like that very close to my family. So, and you you got it right. You know, what do you say to the guy like that? Uh, well, 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 what do you say? Uh, well, you should sort of find him when he is, you know, in a more, in a good mood. You know, if you find him when he's very angry, you know, he'll just kill you. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think a certain amount of, a certain amount of, of being relaxed is demanded for this. So if, if the guy is really sort of into the into the struggle every day, you won't be able to do thought experiments with him. Uh, but hopefully, you know, you might say, yeah, okay, you know, you are so fantastic, you know, that you are so successfully chasing all these women, and congratulations, and I would love to be like you. But imagine if you had a brother who was not like that. You know, he was a sissy, pussy, whatever you want, but he's your brother, you know. And he's desperately in love with the postman. <laughs> you know, and the postman loves him, you know. Would you really, you know, forbid him this and this and this? And if the guy's not pathological, he might say, gee, you know, if it were my brother, you know, maybe I would say, yeah, but what if it were yourself? You know, you come closer to the to the to the target. Uh, I know that in reality there are limits to 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 the discussion, the limits to what you can do in 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 discussing. I see the I see the force of your point, uh, but I wouldn't give up that quickly. That's the. Yeah. Of your How do they interact? I mean, uh, is the level of justification uh, somehow giving stronger motivation, or is it the other way around? Or could the motivational force of the thought experiment somehow hijack the justification and uh, could no. maybe make you disregard the certain weaknesses in justification to the slow that its motivation may not yeah. Uh, yeah. abandon the question of justification? What's the interaction between the two? And, uh, I didn't think about this, so, so thanks for the question. I see the my, my basically my friends <laughs> were pushing me to define the limit between thought experiment in, and utopia, and then I said, you know, utopia is really propaganda. Utopia wants to make you do something, whereas uh, the republic primarily wants to teach you what your justice. So I didn't think about that, but. Uh, uh, now that you ask, uh, let's say that a sincere conviction that something is good and just would normally produce some motivation. So uh, at least you say, gee, you know, given that this, this would be the just arrangement, it would be nice. I would like to have it. 
uh, I think the rest is ecology. I think the rest is ecology. I, I don't think we can do much just by, by philosophizing. Uh, I think there is one, one uh, clear rule, and this is the younger you are, the closer the tie. <laughs> when you're 19 and you think this is really just, you, know, you buy a gun and you go and you fight for it. Oh. You know, when you are 60, you say, gee, you know, this is just, yeah, okay, you know, uh, let me have a coffee and think about it. Uh, so, uh, 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 this is, I think, empirical psychological law. Uh, what about the opposite direction? Whether motivation can hijack justification psychologically? Well, assuming certain intuitions that mean undermine the. I must say, unfortunately, that I have friends to whom this is happening very often. Uh, and you know the uh, it's uh, when you think you are right when you think you know this is really justified you, know, you, you 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 can go into action too quickly and this is the this is a big this is a big danger uh, but it is uh, i think a big part of it is psychological the non psychological part is i think that clear clear insight that something is just and saying, yeah, yeah, this is just. It does give a prima facie motivation. But then how far this would go, how many obstacles it can s overcome, etc. I think this is kind of psychological and, and sociological question, and I think it's worth investigating. I think it was, it's, uh, one, one reason why it's worth in investigating is that uh, so much evil has been done in the name of justice. You know, we're really sure that, you know, justice is on your side. And there are, you know, only, you know, five millions of some idiots who are preventing you. <laughs> and you can liquidate them. You know, you are tempted to liquidate them. I mean, the history of communism was that. Uh, uh, the uh, St. Louis, who was very much into social work and helping the poor, etc. This is, what is this? This is around 1320, you know, 1310 or something to 1350. So let's say 1320 is the, no. So St. Louis uh, managed to burn several thousands of Qatars, of heretics. And his line was, you know, when you, when you are confronting a heretic, you know, what he needs is a sword in his belly, and you have to push the sword to the end. And he was one of the most idealistic kings in French history. And he was saying these things and doing these things because he absolutely believed in the justice of God and saw himself as an instrument of justice. Yeah. And then you go, you move to Trotsky, and you've got basically sort of same kind of mentality, or whoever, Jezinski would be a good example. So I think there is this danger. There is this thing that uh, justice, uh, justice could motivate too much. But it's, you know, our sad political history is not philosophy. <laughs>